Hi and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about material modeling of polybutadiene rubber. This is rubber that's commonly used in tires on cars. And um, I started by looking at what this rubber is all about. And I think it was interesting to look into the new AI tool that's available. It's a kind of a competition to Google in some sense. It's called ChatGPT. And if you type in what is polybutadiene and rubber in this uh, AI, this is what it spits out. So it gives you information about the material that kind of makes sense. It's kind of a good answer in some sense here if you actually were to read through all of this text. The next question I asked this um, uh, AI interface was, what material model should I use for this rubber? <clears throat> right? This is a topic I want to talk about here today. And the answer I got is written here. So it's a, it's a nice verbose message, but the details are perhaps true, but really not that great. It says, well, there are different choices. You can use linear elastic, nonlinear elastic, viscoelastic, and plastic. Okay, that's useful, but it doesn't really answer the question in a good way. But you can kind of see the interest that people have placed into this different kind of probing um, questions that are available through these uh, new AI interfaces. So I thought it was interesting to start by that. I think we can do better than this, and that's what I want to focus on here today. So let's look at the experimental data that I have for this rubber. And uh, I tested the rubber in uniaxial compression, followed by unloading at two different strain rates, and then I did a cyclic test. It was kind of a weird cyclic test, perhaps. I compressed it about to this strain here, and then I cyclically went back and forth here at the frequency of one hertz for 600 seconds. So 600 cycles of load unload here, and then I unloaded it. Um, that's the data that I have, and that's the material model I want to, this is the information I want to base my material model on. So the first thing you do when you have experimental data like this is, what do we really see here in the data? And the, what can we learn from this data? So let's study it. So I'm going to start by looking at these compression followed by unloading curves. Well, clearly the, the loading and the unloading curves are different, so we can't use a hyperelastic model and expect great results. Because for hyperelastic model, any value of strain gives you a value of stress. Not so good here, obviously. <clears throat> we also see that the material is strain rate sensitive here. Uh, different strain rates gives a different response. And we also see something that will give us trouble for material model calibration, as we'll see in that the strain rate dependence during loading is relatively big, but during unloading, it's almost the same curve. That's something that most material models can't do. They, they end up with the same strain rate dependence to both during loading and unloading. So uh, you will, will need to use some specific techniques to overcome that challenge. The last thing I want to point out, and this is when you look at the data, it's very important to keep in mind, uh, is that the, the initial Young's modulus of the material, the slope here, is, is a small mod, modulus. But if you look at the unloading slope, the initial tangent modulus right after unloading is significantly steeper. So there's a difference between loading and unloading slopes for this rubber. And when you see that, that's a clear sign that you have something called the Mullins damage. So we know that this material exhibits Mullins damage and we know there's rate dependent, and it's an interesting, challenging rate dependence that we see in this material. So what I have done is I have calibrated a number of material models to this data using M calibration. And um, I'm going to go through some of the results here. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. So I will just highlight the key points. I'm going to go through the models from worst to best. So this is the worst one. It's a basic hyperelastic model. It's basically just a straight line in the middle here. Not very good. Here's an example where hyperelasticity is not very good for a rubber material. Fitness, the error is about 15%. Here's another model. This is the ANSYS TNM model. So it's available in ANSYS. It's for plastic materials. If you apply it to rubbers, we don't get good results. It's not meant for this type of material. And here's an example of what can happen if you try it. It's really not the way to do it. So, but here it is. The next one is a model that I developed. This is the Bergstrom Boyce model for rubbers. And it actually works surprisingly poorly here too. And the reason for that is that the, the Bergstrom Boyce model here does not have Mullins damage. So the unloading slope here will be the same as the initial slope, and that's not what the material does. 
So the error of 5.5% may not be so high, but it really isn't a great fit. If we turn on Mullins damage, so we have Bergstrom boards with Mullins, the error goes down to 3.9% and it looks significantly better. It's a pretty good fit overall. But if you look carefully, you'll see something interesting. In, in order to get this optimal calibration, the two stream rates here, the green and the blue, are completely overlapping. That is, the, the best fit of this model basically takes away the strain rate dependence because it can't uh, predict the difference in strain rate dependence during compression and then unloading. So that's what we end up with. And if we take this to the extreme, and we basically use just a hyperelastic model with Mullins damage by itself, so no viscoelasticity at all, we get the same predictive error. So the bergstrom boltzmann model is powerful, but for this particular case, it didn't give us any advantage in terms of the viscoelastic properties. What should we do then? Well, let's try linear viscoelasticity with the Mullins model. We need the Mullins model here, we know. And uh, we'll see a little bit of strain rate dependence here between the dashed lines. Error 3.3% is better. So it, this looks pretty decent, actually, in this case. Perhaps this is a useful model. Um, but we can do better. Let's try the Abacus PRF model. So this is a two-network PRF model. I typically recommend two networks for rubbers. I have Mullins damage, of course, in it. And we see very weak strain rate dependence, but overall, it's, it's a pretty decent fit to the prediction. So this is, again, a model that would be reasonably decent for this. But we can still do better. Here is the second best model. So this is number two on my list of material models. This is the polyumod T and V model. This is the one that usually wins in these uh, comparisons that I perform. In this case, I use two networks. I use the Yo plus Mullins damage. For network two, I use the Yo plus a specific flow type element. And we'll see that it looks somewhat similar to the previous uh, case with the PRF model. The fitness is a little bit better and it captures the data reasonably well in this case. But in order to really match this data, what you would have to do is switch over to the polyumod parallel network model, PN, I call it. And um, let's just look at the predictions first. The dashed lines here are exactly right on for the two strain rates. And this flow element that I selected in this parallel network model is such that it can have a different strain rate dependence during loading and unloading. And we get the unloading response as well. Error down to 1.6%, significantly better than any of the other models. And the, the specific equations that I developed for this type of flow element is given here. And it's discussed in more detail in the PolyUmod user's manual if you're interested in this particular flow uh, type model. So to summarize, here are the different material models, the error on the y-axis, different material models on the x-axis. I would not use the ones on the sort of left here. The, the four to the right or so I think are reasonably good. I would pick uh, the TMV model or perhaps the PRF model uh, maybe you can use the linear viscoelastic in this case with Mullins damage as well. Of course, the PN model would be the most accurate, but I typically uh, stick with some of the other ones because those are more commonly used. So, finally, conclusions. Remember, hyperelasticity sometimes is a terrible choice for rubbers. And the, here's an example where we can clearly see that. And that second one is think very carefully about what experimental data you have. So, the type of experimental data you use will influence what material models you can calibrate. So you want to have enough experimental data for the calibration. And in this case, the polyumod TMV and the PN models were the most accurate. If you have any questions, you can ask them below.